Have mercy, Father, upon our hearts as we open them to receive your word. And special mercy upon our speaker. His sins are many. Help us to see Jesus. Only Jesus. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said. My friend Dan is an avid runner. We used to log miles together, but then I got older and he got stronger. And that's a topic for a sermon on staying healthy for another time. He went on to compete and complete an Ironman uh, triathlon in Lake Placid, New York. Of all the Ironman events around the world, Lake Placid is famous for its community participation. The residents of Lake Placid, population 2,500, uh, fill the high school football stadium and the final mile of the Ironman triathlon is run on the high school track, four laps on the high school track. The residents arrive early in the afternoon so they can uh, applaud the winner, and then they stay all afternoon into the evening, into the darkness, so they can applaud the late finishers and the stragglers. And uh, Dan was one of these. (laughs) He had... uh, been running and biking and swimming since 8 a.m. He was uh, a good half hour from the stadium and his legs were cramping, he had blisters, his feet hurt, and it was all he could do to not quit. But then he heard the roar. Then he heard the people. Then he saw the lights on the stadium distant in the future. He said, I began to lift up my chest. And I began to lift my feet. And I began to run harder because of the sound and because of the lights in the future. Within half an hour, he reached the parking lot stadium. By now, the noise was deafening. Over the PA system, as he entered the stadium, he heard someone say, and now from San Antonio, Texas, Dan Smith. People he had never seen erupted and began applauding for him. A stadium full of people and children began shouting, Dan, Dan, Dan. And he began making that last mile around the four laps of the track. He was surrounded by supporters. Gone was the pain. Gone was the difficulty. Gone was the struggle. He was surrounded by a huge cloud and crowd of witnesses. At the core of the Christian promise is this. This race ends in victory. This race ends in victory. And some of you have been running a long, long time. It feels like a marathon. And you're weary. And part of you wants to give up. Part of you wants to throw in the towel. But what God says to you and what God says to me through the book of Revelation is there's a great day coming. And if you incline your ear toward heaven and if you lift up your eyes and look into the future, you can see the lights, you can hear the crowds, and it's enough to cause you to lift up your chest and keep running. The message of Revelation is the final book of the Bible. It seemed like it took us forever to get here. We started in Genesis, and book after book, page after page, chapter after chapter, story after story, person after person, Old Testament into the New Testament, and finally we're looking at the second coming of Christ, looking into the future. Many people are intimidated by studying the book of Revelation, 
It's so full of symbols and images they find difficult to interpret. And granted, it's not an easy book to understand, but it helps to know that the book of Revelation itself has an outline. John, the apostle who authored the book, was instructed by the angel, write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. Write what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. So John is told to write what he has seen. That's chapter 1. He saw Jesus. And then he's told to write what is now. That's the church age. That's why the book of Revelation has letters or, or comments to the churches. That's where we are right now. We're in the age of the church, and the churches can find themselves in chapters 2 and 3. The bulk of the book is comprised with describing what will take place in the future. And that is a specific description of seven years of tribulation that is coming to this earth after the church has been taken into heaven. We won't be there to experience it, but the bulk of the book of Revelation is dedicated to helping us understand what's going to happen during a terrible seven-year day, seven-year stretch of tribulation that will end with the second coming of Christ. And that second coming of Christ is described in Revelation chapter 21 by the coming of the new Jerusalem. Now, I only get one sermon in the book of Revelation in this series, so I'm skipping over to the good stuff. <laughs> to Revelation chapter 21. By this point, the church age has ended, the tribulation is over, and the new kingdom, the heavenly Jerusalem, is about to be inaugurated. And just as my friend Dan could hear the sounds and see the sights of the homecoming, so John the Apostle, the only apparently remaining living apostle, well into his latter years, some people think as old as 80 or 90 years old, quarantined or isolated on the island of Patmos, is given this vision. And he says in chapter 1 and verse 2, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. At least eight times in the book of Revelation, John says, I saw, I saw an angel, I saw the kings of the earth, I saw a white horse, I saw a beast. But this is the only time that he says, but I, John, saw. As if to say, I, that old Galilean fisherman, I, that apostle who placed his head upon the breast of Christ. I, the beloved one, I got to see something no one has ever seen. I saw the new Jerusalem, the city coming down out of heaven. I saw the crown jewel of heaven. For what it's worth, I interpret this literally. I believe a day will come in which a city that we're about to describe will come out of the heavens, a literal, touchable, tangible, walkable city. And the reason I don't think this is just metaphor and symbolic is because of what Jesus said just the night before he was crucified. He said, my father's house has many rooms. And if that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a what? A place for you. I'm preparing a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, then I will come back and take you to be with me so you may be where I am. He's going to prepare a place. It's a Greek word, T-O-P-O-S, topos, a place, topography. It's a literal place. And that place is the new Jerusalem. So a new Jerusalem will, is being created right now in the heavens and someday it will descend from the heavens and it will take its rightful place on this earth. Forgive me, John, we want to say, if I don't get excited about a new city. When I think city, I think congestion and smog and traffic and shanty towns. We don't get excited about cities. We could get excited about a new valley or a new lake, but a new Jerusalem. 
Why should we be excited about a new city? As if anticipating our reluctance, he describes the city and gives us two wonderful implications. Number one, God has space for us. God has space for us. The angel who talked to me held in his hand a gold measuring stick to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. When he measured it, he found it was a square as wide as it was long. In fact, its length and width and height were each 1,400 miles. He then measured the walls and found them to be 216 feet thick, according to the human standard used by the angel. You can dismiss any thought of congestion. The New Jerusalem stretches the imagination. 1,400 miles in length, width, and height. How big is that? 1,400 miles. Large enough to contain the landmass from the Appalachians to the West Coast. From Canada to Mexico. 40 times the size of England. Larger than the nation of India. And that's just the ground floor. The city stands as tall as it does stand wide. Suppose God stacks the city, stacks the stories in the city as an architect stacks stories in a building. Then we're looking at a city that has, hang on to your hat, 600,000 floors. Plenty of room for billions of faithful people. It comes equipped with gates, so there is a place to go and to come, which suggests that there will be nature outside of the city, but the heart of God's creation will be this new Jerusalem, and it will have ample space for you. Jesus says, in my Father's house, there are many rooms. (laughs) I think so. There are many rooms. And guess what? There's ample room for you. How long were you alive before you realized that life doesn't always have room for you? How long were you alive before you realized that, oh, not everybody gets to make the team. Not everybody gets to go to that school. Not everybody gets their own bed. It's sometimes constricted and restricted. How long were you on earth before you realized not everybody has time for you? Maybe your dad didn't have time for you. Or maybe the world didn't have space for you. This is as if the apostle wants to say, heaven has plenty of room. Plenty of room for all God's faithful. Not only does it have plenty of room, it has plenty of provision. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. In the center of the city, there's a tree that is so large, it spans both sides of the great river that runs through the city. Its harvest is so rich, it requires 12 months to gather an ample city with abundant provisions. That's great news for the thousands of people who squeeze pennies out of the dollar, who live not just month to month, but week to week and day to day. Blessed are the poor, Jesus once said, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What great news this is for people who struggle to have enough. There's a day coming when there will be plenty of space Plenty of provision for them. But then someone might say, well, but will God allow me to be in the city? After the decisions I've made, after the poor choices I've made, will he allow someone like me to come into that city? You're going to like this. Not only does God have space for us, then John says God has grace for us. 21.12 She had a great and high wall with 12 gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. 12 gates, 12 foundations, on the gates and on the foundations, the names of the 12 tribes and the names of the 12 apostles. Now, don't go 
too quickly past that. Stop and think about the names that are on the gates. Stop and think about the names that are on the foundations. Who are these 12 sons of Israel whose names we see on the city gates? Well, Simeon and Levi would be listed there. You remember their story? They were the two brothers, the two children, or two sons of Jacob who convinced a tribe of men to undergo circumcision. And then three days into their recovery, they attacked and killed them. Then there was Judah, another one of the twelve, a son of Jacob, who mistook his daughter-in-law, Tamar, for a harlot he slept with and impregnated her. Then there were the nine brothers who conspired to kill another brother, Joseph, and they would have succeeded had Reuben not intervened, so they just sold Joseph into Egyptian slavery. These are warring, scheming hustlers. Sounds more like a nightclub crowd than the names you would engrave on the walls or the entrance into the city of Jerusalem. And then what about the apostles? Uh, Peter's name is carved on the foundation. Peter, the apostle who saved his skin instead of saving his savior. James and John, remember, they were the ones whose mother demanded VIP seats for for them in heaven. There was Thomas the dubious who wanted a personal audience with Jesus. All of these names make heaven's honor roll. Uh, These are the disciples who told the children to leave Jesus alone, who told Jesus to leave the hungry alone, and most of all, who left Jesus alone at his crucifixion. All the disciples forsook him and fled, the scripture says. Matthew did, Peter did, Bartholomew did. All of the names that appear on the foundations are names of men who are there only by the great grace of God. When we carve people's names into walls, it's because they're heroes or or it's because they're philanthropists. When God carves someone's name into the wall of his city, it's because he has covered them with a great and unquenchable grace. I have grace for you. I have grace for you, he says. Some of you need to hear that. I sense in my spirit that somebody right now needs to hear that God has great grace for you. You've been thinking for a long time that God is angry and that God is ticked off. But he's using this message right now to melt that fear and tell you, oh, I've got your name written in the book of life. He will not remember your sin And if there is news even greater than that, it is this, from Revelation 22 and verse 3. No longer will there be any curse. He will not only remove your sin, he will remove, listen to this, your capacity to sin. I can't wait to see you in the new Jerusalem. That tendency you have towards selfishness, that'll be gone. That tendency I have toward greed, that'll be gone. That tendency we have toward competition and warring and fighting with each other, gone, gone, gone. We will finally be the people God created his people to be. There will no longer be any curse. Remember what the curse is. The curse is the consequence of sin. The curse is the consequence of sin. The shame, the fear, the anger, the hostility, all that creates the chaos and the havoc on the world right now, in the world right now, is the curse. The curse is the consequence of sin. It's it's, it's the hangover of the rebellion. Adam and Eve sinned. They relied on a tree to give them what only God could give life. And when they sinned, innocence caught the last flight to Seattle, opening the door for guilt and shame to move in. Everything changed. No longer did they walk with God in the cool of the evening. They feared God and they avoided his presence. When God asked, where are you? Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. What happened? Sin happened. 
He had been walking with God in the cool of the evening, unashamed. But now because of sin, when he hears the voice of God, he assumes that God is mad and he hides. And people have been hiding from God ever since, covering themselves up, not with fig leaves, but with careers and busyness and habits and addictions, covering up their pain, covering up their loneliness. Relating to God was no longer as simple as a walk in the garden, nor was relating to each other We have the impression that Adam and Eve got along pretty well before sin. But after sin, Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the snake. The snake was nowhere to be found. And relationships became complex. Even their two sons attacked each other. And their days became numbered. The knockout punch of the curse was death. God said, you will return to the ground for out of it you were taken. So as fast as you can bite an apple, humanity began running from God. Nature began a war with humanity. And our lifespan had an expiration date. Everything changed. But all of that is going to be removed in the new Jerusalem. Again, Revelation 22, 3. No Longer will there be any curse. I can't imagine a world with no curse. I can't imagine a world where we truly love God and love our neighbor. Can you? I can't imagine a world where we truly have nothing but goodness among us and our streets are flooded with kindness and love is the hallmark of the city. And joy is written on each and every one of our hearts. I have a hard time imagining that because we've never seen it. But that day is coming. I'm making everything new, Jesus said. Everything new. The old will be gone. Gone with the hospital waiting rooms. Gone with the tear-stained divorce papers. Gone with the motionless ultrasounds. Gone with the loneliness, the foreclosure notices, and the abuse. Gone with the cancer. Jesus says, I am making everything new. The ultimate act of redemption by a redeemer will be to take this world so stained and bloodied with violence and heartache, and he'll make it all new. He'll wash it new. He will reclaim every atom, every emotion, every insect, every animal, every relationship, and every galaxy. He will reclaim every diseased body and every diseased mind because he is the king and it rightfully belongs to him. And to do anything less would be an admission of defeat and he will not be defeated. The created world, Paul says, can hardly wait for what's coming next. Even the trees can sense it. Even the globe can sense it. Even the universe can sense it. There is a rumbling. The created world can hardly wait. So every page, every promise of the Bible invites us and lures us with the hope of a new day, a new earth, and a new kingdom. Would you let the promise of the new kingdom excite you? Feels like a marathon, doesn't it? Feels like a triathlon. We get tired. We grow weary. And too many people are just giving up. To that emotion of despair, God says, lift up your eyes. Listen for the sound. Look at the lights. You're almost finished. Can you hear? Can you hear the people? Can you hear them calling your name? Who's calling your name? Is there a grandmother who taught you how to pray? Who's long gone before? Is there a Sunday school teacher? who gave you your first Bible, who's looking down on you right now? Is there a mom or a dad? Maybe there's one of your children, an unborn child. 
Maybe they're just a good friend. Can you hear them? Would you allow your spirit to hear them say, come on, don't give up. It's all right. You don't know how close you are to the finish line. Would you allow that thought to cause you to lift up your shoulders and go at it again? Give more forgiveness. Be more patient. Seek to be more like Christ. Just keep going, keep going, keep going. A friend of mine sent me an email just a couple of weeks ago telling me about a friend who had surgery performed on her brain and removing a tumor. The doctor was concerned that the slightest miscue had the potential to cause the loss of either her memory or her eyesight. And so he gave the woman the option of which side of the tissue uh, upon which they would operate. In other words, if it came to it, if she had to lose either her memory or her eyesight, which would she rather lose? She said, I think I need to give that some thought. And she did. And she contacted the doctor the next day. She said, if I have to lose one, I would prefer to lose my memory. And the doctor said, the chance of that happening is extremely remote. But thank you for telling me. And I'm wondering, why? How did you arrive at your decision? And the woman said, well, I'd rather see where I'm going than know where I've been. Can you see where you're going? Oh, what joy awaits you, my friend. What glory awaits you. What purity awaits you. And what an opportunity awaits you and me when we see face to face Jesus Christ, our King, who died for us, who will come for us, and who has promised us in my Father's house There are many mansions, and I am going to prepare a place for you. Amen. Most Heavenly Father, we bless you now. We bless you, and we thank you. Our lives can get so small. Our eyes can get so low to the ground that we forget to lift up our eyes and look into the future. Would you grant us, by virtue of your Holy Spirit who lives within us, this sense of excitement and joy about the next life, about the new Jerusalem. This is our prayer through Christ. And all the church said,